from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. First, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce our main okay. presenter, Rich, who I, I think she is finally getting her sound up and running. Thanks, Cindy. Cindy is director of the Library of Congress Teaching with Primary Sources program at Eastern Illinois University in Charleston, Illinois. She's also a faculty member in the Department of Secondary Education there, where she teaches a course on literacy, differentiation, and assessment for pre-service teachers seeking certification in any secondary level content area. I'm Cheryl Letterly, and I'm an Educational Resource Specialist at the Library of Congress, and I'll be supporting Cindy on this session. One of my jobs in that support role is to collect questions, and I will be giving those back to Cindy um, in the last 10 minutes of our time together. So it looks like many of you have found the chat box. Please use that box again to enter your questions and I'll collect them. Now I'm going to turn this over to Cindy Rich. So I want to thank you very much for taking time to join this session this after or this evening, actually. Um, we're very excited to be here this afternoon for the first Library of Congress online conference for teachers, and we are going to jump right in. During this session, we're going to talk a little bit about opportunities to increase content knowledge and free students' minds and promote inquiry. Strong literacy skills and content knowledge free the mind for independence and inquiry. And every time I see this slide, I think of the En Vogue song, free your mind and the rest will follow because it really it just happens naturally once we empower students to go after information the rest will just come we'll look at ways that we can make this happen and i hope you'll continue your discussions and sharing ideas in the chat area you won't offend us at all teachers are great at multitasking but i would like to ask you if you don't mind just to put, um, share in that chat box what maybe state you're from and then also what content area you teach just so we can have an idea of who's in the in the room with us math civics library this is awesome we have a nice mix of both grade levels and content areas and I think that that's the beauty of, of literacy that we are all um, going through the same steps trying to help students learn and we're going to talk about that today all right we've even got pre-k through 12 represented with the library Wonderful. This is a great mix. This is so exciting. I'm, I'm so pumped to see this. Okay, well, hopefully we'll hit something for everyone. And while we're doing this, please, please, please be, be more than willing to share with your colleagues online here um, what you're doing and how any of these things apply to your classroom or anything you want to contribute. The first thing we're going to talk about in this session is that we're going to talk about the value of engaging learners and activating prior knowledge to establish that foundation within a content area. Schools are a little bit unique because we expect our students to leave one classroom and then enter another classroom while they completely shift their focus. All right, and for those of you in the middle school and high school, we won't even talk about the adolescent brain and asking them to do this. But we know that the real world doesn't work that way. Whenever we work with people and talk with people, we're constantly crossing content areas. And you know what we're talking about primarily in one meeting may come up during other meetings. But it's sort of like the waves on a beach where the topics come in and go out and just kind of crash together. And so we're asking our students to switch just because a bell rings. And so it's important that we get them all on the same page when we start a class. We want everyone to be on that same page, but we know and we recognize 
that students have different skill levels and interests when they come into our classroom. And so we want to be able to pull that out of those students so everyone can, can learn from what we're doing. The second part of the session is going to be looking at how we can present key content information while also supporting literacy skills and using primary sources as teaching tools. tools. Again, those multitasks that we're so good at. The key to this is making the primary source work for you. We all know primary sources are really cool, but you want to be sure that you're getting something from that primary source when you use it in a learning activity. And it needs to earn its place in your classroom. It's not just decoration. It has to be, the primary source has to be a tool that you're using to teach. Of course, this involves really thoughtful planning before you even select a primary source. And so those primary sources need to be relevant, appropriate, and best of all, engaging. Luckily, Library of Congress has millions of these, so we won't have a problem finding ones that we can use. As teachers within our content areas, you already know which strategies are effective during different points of the learning cycle. And so we're going to choose strategies that give opportunities for repeated exposure to vocabulary and concepts, expose students to the nuances, academic language, and discourse of your content area or whatever topic you're talking about, and encourage students to connect and transfer information within our content area and in a perfect world outside of our contact area, content area and what they're learning down the hall. And I can't make the slides change, so I don't know if Kathy or <laughs> Cheryl can help me with that. Thank you. Well, I'll do a little ding when it comes time. Um, all right, to start out, each of us bring a unique perspective, background, our strengths, our weaknesses, and interest into what we're doing. And this is what makes teaching amazing, but also makes it challenging. So if you don't mind, in the chat area, would you let us know, is this your first year teaching, 20th year teaching, or somewhere in between? I'm, I'm very curious as to what level of experience. All right. Student teaching, pre-service, 22 years, 23 years. Great. I <laughs> lost count. <laughs> I get that. All right. Well, each of us are bringing our own level of expertise in anything we do. But no matter how long you've been doing it, you speak teaching. We know that, you know, just by looking at this, there are teachers who, are, who speak science, teachers who speak social studies, special education, and all these different content areas. But now my question for you is, what else do you speak? And so this may be a hobby, it may be a content area, it may be a skill, it may be a medical condition. Anything that you know well enough that you speak. Margaret speaks tech. Chris speaks politics. Mac speaks swimming. Bonnie speaks history, outdoors, tennis. All right, we're seeing hobbies, we're seeing work, we're seeing pleasure. And this is awesome because it may come from a desire, just something you want to do, or it may come from necessity. But you've learned the art of discourse in that topic. Genealogy, athletics, very cool. What a great group. Man, I wish we were all together. This would be fun. All right. So we know, though, for students who are new to a concept or struggle with material, something as small as vocabulary can be a huge... We are together, Cheryl. You're right. All right. We can be... Something as simple as vocabulary can be a hurdle. And so we want to take that hurdle away for our students. Have you ever been in a situation where everyone in a conversation knows someone and is talking about them, but you have no idea who that person is? That little piece of information comes in really handy. We want our students to be in a position where they know what we're talking about. If they don't know what you're talking about, they can't take it to the next level and get the information. 
So we're going to talk about these terms on the screen in a few minutes. Have you ever heard any of the, I mean, this is a rhetorical question. Have you heard any or all of these terms defined? In the chat, I'm going to ask you to share either a formal definition for any of these words that you've heard or just a, in casual conversation how you've heard these described. There are no wrong answers here. I'm not asking you to define them. I'm asking what you have heard in relation to these terms. So you can't, you can't get it wrong. Nice, Matthew. All right. Literacy and fluency. <laughs> Jenna says informational texts are boring, which we all know they're not. Sometimes we're convincing our students that. All right. Well, not to rush you, but for the sake of this, this presentation, these are the meanings that I've assigned to these words. Doesn't mean that other descriptions or definitions are wrong. These are just within the context of the session what we're going to use. So for informational text, Remove this from the fiction, nonfiction, or genre conversation. For this presentation, we're simply going to refer to informational text as anything you get information from. All right, Common Core State Standard documentation says that paraphrase, or informational text are books about diverse topics, technical text, and digital sources on a range of topics. But we are t talking big. I want you to just think no limits as to what an informational text can be. Literacy. Once upon a time, that was simply defined as the ability to read and write. But now the term literacy is hurtled over academic walls and means knowledge that relates to a specific subject. Literacy has become completely embedded in our normal vocabulary to describe the ability to strategically understand, communicate, and act within a context. And last week, I know I've heard the phrases financially literate, football literate, and cancer literate, because these are different contexts where people learn the language, learn how to both give and take information, and how to perform or act within that context. So you, it's being aware. And then fluency, if we think about being fluent in a foreign language or a second language, it's basically the ability to not just be able to say the words and speak it, but to go beyond just recognition to comprehend and construct meaning. We want them to speak science and be fluent in science or Shakespeare or politics or the Harlem Renaissance or whatever it is that we're talking about in our classroom. Once they're able to fluently speak, the content, then they can really dig into the meat of what we're doing in our class. By mastering contextual awareness, we can focus on a deeper understanding and new knowledge. All right, from the Library of Congress teachers page and experiences, I know primary sources engage students. Primary sources help students relate in a personal way to events of the past and promote deeper understanding of history of, as a series of human events. Because primary sources are snippets of history, they encourage students to seek additional evidence through research. And first-person accounts of events help make them more real, fostering active reading and response. A thoughtful, thoughtfully selected primary source can be provocative, and set a tone for a class activity or a learning environment. You choose something like this image that we're looking at right now. It's a pretty casual tone, but it's interesting to us. What part of this image grabbed your attention? <laughs> We've got some fishermen and fisherwomen. 
right? Love this, especially the me, the gas sign, the prices. Jenna noticed the font size because it was large. Megan noticed the, the cactus. Very good. You guys are noticing it all. The you drive it cars. They were texting a long time ago, apparently. All righty. Well, as we look at things that catch our attention, we're using our prior knowledge and experiences. We put this new information into a schema or context that's meaningful for us. So we have our first impression, but now let's closely read the image for a specific purpose. All right, do you think this photo was taken in your hometown? <laughs> maybe or maybe not. What context clues do you use to determine a location for this photo? All right, we're looking at plants, the language, the spelling, the cactus. All right, near body of water, very good. Awesome, you guys are doing great. Well, we know this photo, oops, sorry, hit the arrow on the computer, all right. This photo is actually from Santa Fe, New Mexico. It was taken in 1938 by Dorothea Lange, and many of you probably know um, Dorothea Lange's work. She did The Migrant Mother and a lot of the, the iconic photos that we see today. Anyway, the post-its in this picture represent the thoughts of one of my colleagues. We use what we know, our background, to read this photo. And then we use the vocabulary based on what we know to discuss it. So while my science friends can talk about the plant species, I can talk about the fishing worms. <laughs> All right, we each have strengths and interests that we bring to what we do. But we're putting it into a schema or context that's meaningful to us. You know, what did, the question, Maria, what did they mean by you drive it cars? That's a really good question because in 1938, I don't know what was happening with rental cars and things like that. So that's a great question. All right. So we put this into a sense of place, but it may be something we're interested in the time that the photo was taken, or even just we're interested in the price of gas and how much it's changed and why we can't go back to those prices. But this explains this explains how the image draws you in and where you want to go from there. So within this activity we just did, real quickly, and I won't define all of these every time because we will run out of time, but we're looking at contextual awareness. This is the frame of reference. We're using explicit and implicit clues to build knowledge, we're recognizing the evidence that's there but that we each use evidence differently or find different types of evidence. We're triggering our prior knowledge. We're using context clues, both words and images. We're thinking about the author purpose if we look at that sign and the breakdown of gas prices. And then the real life application, bringing it into our lives. What the heck does this have to do with me? Well, I know I complain about gas prices. The next primary source I'm showing you, we're going to look at mastering contextual vocabulary and nuances. Because once we do that, we can move into deeper understanding and new information. All right, so as teachers, we know introducing a word in isolation is not an effective way to teach vocabulary. Our students benefit if we're able to reinforce new terms through either morphemic awareness, breaking it down into those word parts, my English teacher friends, and that, and using context clues. In the end, we want them to be able to decode new words on their own. That's a life skill. It's something we need to empower them into doing. If they aren't caught up in the mechanics of reading, they gain independence and confidence and then can really focus on the content and what else they want to know. 
We need to know where students stand regarding vocabulary and concepts in a specific content. So instead of finding, you know, kind of content area specific resources for this presentation, I picked some that were just kind of interesting to me. And that, so this is a piece of sheet music, take me out to the ball game. All right, so within a new context, it's demanding to receive information while still trying to decode or understand what the words mean. Look at the lyrics of the song. Which words catch your eye as we discuss vocabulary and nuances? Cracker Jacks, we know that one. Everybody must be hungry. Root, excellent. They know the word root. They know home team. What's another phrase maybe? Very good, you guys are on top of it. All right, so we see root, root, root for the home team. Students will know what the word root means. But the fact that it's used differently here, and it's used three times, has specific meaning. Home team, they should understand that, but we explain it. And then the same for three strikes, you're out. That's a different context in different settings. And without understanding what it means in this context, they wouldn't get the gist of what the song is. This time we're looking at vocabulary. Words we know, old words that we already know, but applying them to a new meaning. Context clues and contextual language. And so great, we're seeing in the chat how people are using the word root and how it can be perceived differently. And these are little obstacles that can slow our students down in the classroom that we may not think to mention. All right, I've got another good one for you. Do you know enough to know what to ask? An initial look at a primary source is naturally going to inspire questions. But to formulate those questions, students use their literacy skills to receive information while connect. Start over again. Students use literacy skills to receive information while they're connecting again with that prior knowledge and schema. So the question is, do you know enough about the content to even know what to ask? This is where fluency comes in. We want our classrooms to be a space where students are encouraged to ask questions and are praised for doing so. We should nurture this. This is why we as teachers love to answer a question with a question, right? A thoughtful question requires a student to determine what it is they want to know and why they want to know it. Successfully establishing a purpose for a question requires comprehending and critiquing a source. So they have to know what they don't know. And that's moving to the next level of understanding. If I add another photo, do your questions change? Does your frame of reference shift? As we acquire new information, it may answer some questions we had from the first picture, but now we may have even more questions about what we're looking at. And this is where we draw upon our expertise, and when we choose classroom strategies, we try to find things that are going to guide students through this process. For example, we may use a primary source analysis sheet it's going to lead them from low-level thinking skills of just observation to more synthesis and using the information and drawing their own conclusions. Or we may even use something like a Venn diagram to do a compare and contrast with a photo like this. The top photo, as you can see, were the Chicago Cubs, National League pennant winners in 1929. The bottom photo was the first Colored World Series, opening game October 11, 1924, in Kansas City, Missouri. So as you can see, I'm partial to the Midwest here. All right. Again, we're using those literacy skills. 
looking at context and setting, relationships, the implicit and explicit, de explicit details. Things like, why is there a huge crowd in the bottom picture but not in the top? So we want to move through things like that. But these sk skills are really important. This is why we thoughtfully select our primary sources. All right. OK, we got started a little bit late, so I'm going to kind of rush through this a little bit. By understanding text structure, we can focus on deeper understanding and new knowledge. So we've talked about vocabulary. And we've talked about contextual awareness. But what about text structure? The following slides are a part of my own research. We had an ice storm here in Illinois a few years ago. And I thought, well, I'm going to look and see what types of resources I can find that I can use to talk about weather from maybe 100 years ago. And so I went to Chronicling America. And Chronicling America is amazing. There's a session going on right now, and hopefully some of you will be able to watch the recording of that because it's just an unbelievable collection. But as I was perusing through all the front pages and articles, I found references to a storm in the early days of 1912. There was a horrific cold wave that went through. So once I found my date, moved on with my search. But before we even start looking at content, let's talk about the importance of text structure. All right, We know how a newspaper is structured. We know what it looks like. Some of our students today may not have that knowledge. But we know that what are some of the, the attributes of a newspaper that you see in the text structure? Right, larger type in the headlines, just the use of headlines at all. Great, Amy and Annette. All right, and Janelle's talking about the bylines. The dates, usually pretty easy to find. Good, so all these little attributes. And you know, we want to talk about these things when we work with students with their textbooks about unit headings and font size and things like that. But here in the newspaper, we can see it as well. But we also know that the text structure supports how we acquire information. And so, you know, we may look specifically for just the main headlines, but we also want to look at, at smaller text, different types of fonts, and all of that to see how much information is shared. So on the topic of text structure, we're looking at how it's structured, how it, one thing relates to another, how a story develops through the use of the text structure, the relationships between text, implicit, explicit details, and author intent. Why did a newspaper choose that to be their headline? If we have contextual fluency and understand text structure, we can then move into something called author intent and diverse perspectives. All right, so now, being confident in my ability to move or maneuver around chronicling America, understanding text structure, recognizing familiar vocabulary, I stopped thinking about the mechanics of my search and was able to concentrate on the content that I wanted to know what was happening with these storms in different parts of the country on January 6th of 1912. This is where the real fun started. But while getting lost in these pages of old newspapers, and I mean hundreds of pages of old newspapers, I made two important discoveries. Take a look at these pages and see what catches your eye. What do they have in common? What differs? What else do you want to know? Weather. Cold. And of course, at the very top of each one, right? Geography, there you go. 
the very top we see the name of the newspaper, where it is, where this was happening. We also see that you know the date is featured there. It's a little blurry on these, but it's also available. But we see what different newspapers chose to put as headlines on their front page and what, how important a front page is. So we see again text structure, relationships, and recurring words. All three of these newspapers talked about the cold. All three of these newspapers referred to suffering and relief and distress that was happening. And so that is important. It was important to see how this was reported from different places. New York and Washington were experiencing this, but really important, the Hawaiian Star. That one blew my mind. First of all, because 1912, was Hawaii even a state at that point? Nope. Exactly so. They were curious. They were concerned of what was happening in the mainland. And I found that really interesting. And I am powering through these. I apologize. I'm going so fast. All right. This is a headline in the first few sentences of one of the articles. You can see the entire article on the right. But for now, we're just going to focus on this part. The one on the right is from Chronicling America. You can do clippings of articles and use them with students. It's an amazing tool. But in these brief paragraphs, do you see any vocabulary that keeps recurring or themes? All right, we see widespread weather. If we look at the headlines, do the words that we see underneath, underneath support? those headlines. Temperature, temperature, cold. All right. Well, we previously talked about, remember we saw the same words used in different contexts within Take Me Out to the Ball Game? And examples like this, we're using the same words within the same context. But why are they used so many times within the same context? All right, we see the word suffering several times, charity and aid. The reason this is mentioned so many times is because this is a key point in the text. And so we want students to understand that. that whenever uh, you know details are provided repeatedly, that usually means it's an important point. And so we want them to focus on things like that. And as Cheryl said, all of these are hot linked within this presentation and will be available at the end too. All right, so students can see how to construct arguments. All right, the headline is there's much suffering already in the city. And they say the suffering's already widespread. The next paragraph widespread suffering. We can also focus and purposely receive information, asking our students to focus on key points and repeated words. Gives them a purpose for reading. And as they're starting to look at something, they may create their own hypothesis and either confirm or contradict the hypothesis that they had. So in 1912, snow was going to be accompanied by zero weather. Temperatures were scheduled to drop. Much suffering already. However, the children of Washington see a bright spite bright side in the skating prospects. So at least the children were looking on the bright side. All right, so we looked at what was information was reported on the same day and how it may have been fluctuating from two different locations. When we think about things like that, when I think about events like 9-11 and how it was presented differently in different countries or how people react to events differently in different places. Letting students look at information like that and compare and contrast those diverse perspectives and then also 
come up with their own conclusion as to why people in different communities reacted in different ways. So we looked at that. Now we're going to look at how information is reported differently within two cities. This Washington Times front page, the top left there, the big one, says charity workers are busy with the poor. And so that leads us to think this is a really important story. This is a major topic. But then the Chicago-based Daybook made little mention of the cold ravaging the city on their front page. And you have to go all the way to page 7 to find information. But on page 7, we have a whole story. All right. Now, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but it had never crossed my mind that a hundred years ago, people were concerned with what to do with the homeless in the city during harsh winters. That had just never occurred to me. And so as I'm looking at this, all of a sudden it's like, wow, I didn't even know what I didn't know about this topic. It goes on about what the fire departments and the police and different charities were doing for people at this time. And so my fluency level with regards to that topic in today's time, I'm aware of it. But 100 years ago, I was not. So I started drawing on what I know now to understand what they were talking about 100 years ago. This article details the plight of homeless men and endangered women and children in Chicago in 1912. So beyond just looking at how things are reported in different places or how things are reported at different you know, cities and perspectives, but here we're looking at information a century apart and considering the perspectives in that way, connecting it with our life. And so one of the ways that we used this, this article with some students was through annotation. And using annotation, students can. They can identify main ideas. And the awesome thing about Library of Congress primary sources is that you can print those items out or pull them up on your smart board and let students actively engage with them, get hands-on involvement with it but identifying main ideas, drawing arrows to, you know, connect ideas. This happened first, this happened second. It can go as, and Jenna talks about, have you been able to teach annotation? That's a great question, Jenna, and how people are, are using this in their classroom. It may be something very basic, like just highlighting main ideas and taking them through the, the stages of developing annotation skills. Because it isn't easy and it's not natural. It's something that we have to think about while we're doing. But through the different colors, and I'm a different, I'm a very visual learner. I like different colored highlighters and post-its and things like that. I like the arrows. I like being able to interact with the text. Letting students circle words that they don't recognize or anything that's new and giving them a chance. So, you know, hopefully the rest of you are using things like this in your classroom as well, either through annotation or just multiple text at the same time, presenting information in those multiple texts. So, I am like so proud of myself right now because we, yes, they, they can be downloaded. Most of them are available and whenever you go into Chronicling America, Rebecca, um, you can clip them and they come as a PDF or a JPEG. Chronicling America is some very cool stuff. So, to wrap this up, um, this is you know one of what I preach all the time. To be literate in a specific context is the difference between existing and thriving within that context. And it's not good enough for our students just to exist in our classrooms. We want our students to thrive. And so on that note, the next um, slide is going to just be a list of resources. Oh, there we go. Cheryl's on top of things. Um, these are the resources from this presentation. And that's all I've got. So thank you very much.
Thanks so much, Cindy. This was a, a whirlwind, but I think you really hit some highlights <laughs> and the chat conversation suggests some wonderful, lively conversation. So the first question that I have for you is, <clears throat> with so many different disciplines represented in today's webinar meeting, any starting places or tips to people to integrate literacy into disciplines or classes where that might not be a traditional part of the teaching, but um, we all see read the standards and read the movements toward integrating literacy across the curriculum. So thoughts on how to get started, and especially if this isn't what is your central focus. <laughs> That's actually a great question because so often whenever we talk about literacy, people assume we're just talking about the act of reading. And it's so much more than that. And so the first step is to think beyond the mechanics of reading letters on a piece of paper. That there's so much more to it, that it is vocabulary, that it's understanding what the topic is that it's reading, writing, speaking, and listening, and be able to do it with a purpose as opposed to just doing it. And so really what we're doing, it's, literacy is so much more than just getting information. It's actually, it's understanding and using information. So it is as simple as teaching your students how to speak within your, your content area. It's the vocabulary and the nuances how information is organized within your content area. Information in science is organized differently than it is in history classroom. And so little things like that are really developing literacy skills from day one. Most teachers are doing it. They're just not calling it that. First, I want to thank everybody for joining us. We do have a few minutes, so go ahead and put those questions in the chat box if you'd like while we um, have Cindy Rich and the combined experience and information of all of the participants. This has been a rich and lively conversation. Um, for completing this session, you have earned a certificate worth one instructional hour, and you will receive an email within five business days with directions on how to access that. Um, Amy has a great question. Where would be a great place to start searching for primary sources within your content? One of the things that I know frustrates some teachers is that the Library of Congress website is not Google. And so I always tell students and teachers that I work with, you have to know what you're looking for before you start looking on the Library of Congress. This is not for, for the lighthearted. You have to have some knowledge and understanding of the content area before you start. And so really, it, it, you know, the, everybody knows that the Library of Congress site can be daunting because it is just so huge and it offers so much for us. But you can go into the teacher's page and look for primary source sets that have already been created and use those as inspiration. Or just, you know, my, my go-to move is going to that home page and starting on that search box and just typing something in and then seeing what comes up in other subjects and other related terms and other places that come up within those answers. And so, you know, you, that's a great way to do it. And of course, ask a librarian, which, you know, Dana put up there. But I, I was going to say that, Dana, because it always blows my mind how quickly someone gets back to me with the ask a librarian. I mean, you guys are so on top of things at the Library of Congress. And it is a wonderful, wonderful resource. They are there to help you. And man, they'll guide you in your search to save you so much time. And just to you know, get your confidence up that you're heading in the right direction. We have done a webinar on Chronicling America for National History Day a couple of weeks ago, and we have another one coming up in mid-November. One of the things that Lynn O'Hara says over and over again when we work with NHD 
is that any text in the hands and mind of a creative student can work for a National History Day theme. They make those themes deliberately pretty broad so that it's easy to make connections. Um, so Dana's chiming in. Again, Dana is the reference librarian for the library's education team. Remember earlier, Cindy, Cindy mentioned that time when people are talking about somebody that most everybody else knows. We had a little insider joke about Dana, who's chiming in about Ask a Librarian. But um, we do have lots of starting places for finding primary sources, um, and, and Cindy named a bunch of them. And we also do have Ask a Librarian to help you. Um, we are now at the end of our time together. So I want to say thank you so much. Say, thank you, Cindy Rich, for sharing um, such a carefully crafted presentation of so many strategies. Thank you again to all of the participants for sharing from your perspectives and experiences. If you haven't taken a moment to go to the SurveyMonkey link, it's three short questions. Um, your feedback really does help us shape future programming. So I am going to stop the recording and then end the meeting with, again, a word of thanks to all of you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.